Girl with the Flaxen Hair is another one of Debussy's most played pieces. It's number eight in his first book of 12 preludes, and the rest of the preludes are kind of in a more mature style. They're less diatonic, more expressionist and exotic and even dramatic. But the musical language of this piece is much more similar to what Debussy wrote earlier in his career in the famous Claire de Lune and the first arabesque. It's more melodic, more tonal, and super nice lush chords rolling organically up and down the piano register. The title technically comes from a poem by the French poet La Conte de Lille, and the first line there goes on the Lucerne midst flowers in bloom, who sings praises to morning? It is the girl with golden hair, the beauty with lips of cherry. But that poem has a sentiment of kind of strong and happy feelings about love, which is not really the right character for the music. This prelude is more about innocence. Sure, there are some nice intriguing harmonies as always in Debussy, but it's mostly about melodic modesty and innocence. So I tend to agree more with the pianist and professor Paul Roberts, who has written a book about Debussy's piano music, Images, and he writes there, The music is far nearer in mood to Wordsworth's poem The Solitary Reaper, though to suggest any actual connection is purely conjectural. It is not, however, implausible that Debussy, who we know greatly admired the English Romantic poets, might have connected La Conte Lille's flaxen-haired Scottish girl the poem is one of the Chansons Écossaises, Scottish songs, with Wordsworth solitary highland lass reaping and singing by herself. Debussy, whose identification with exotic faraway scenes is manifested throughout the preludes, would have found Wordsworth evocation of the girl's solitary song breaking the silence of the seas among the farthest Hebrides deeply satisfying. And this uh, poem by Wordsworth, the final line there is, I have to read it, it's so good. It goes like this. Whatever the theme the maiden sang, as if her song could have no ending, I saw her singing at her work and o'er the sickle bending. I listened motionless and still, and as I mounted up the hill, the music in my heart I bore long after it was heard no more. Doesn't that fit so perfectly with the character of the music? Now, when we analyze the music, there are three chords that Debussy is kind of going between throughout the piece. It's G flat major, that the key that the prelude is in. And then there's the C flat major and E flat major and minor as the median between G flat and C flat. And have a look out for those chords when I go through the music. Uh, they have important roles to play. So we start with this solo and simple melody. Sans rigueur is without rigor, so kind of free. I play this with full pedal to get some nice vibrating sounds of the piano. And here, for the first time, we get a, a harmony, G flat major. And this is a plagal cadence with the C flat major, the subdominant. It's Amen, brother. And then a long chord, this D flat major. And then we get kind of an elaboration of the melody, a second statement. With full chords on all these. And we're modulating to E flat major here. But I wanna mention this upbeat first. The way it's written, it looks like it should be part of the previous phrase, these two eighth notes. But I think I disagree with Debussy. I think it's impossible to play in a way that they belong to the previous group because we spent so long time on this G flat major. But the music momentum dies. And then whatever we play after this, it's gonna sound like something new. And this really looks like an upbeat, so I play it as an upbeat, so now. So E 
flat major. This is an exciting medium. Uh, we get the B flat major as a dominant uh, doing the modulating. And now we get the initial melody again, but with a new harmony, kind of a cheeky, uh, tricky harmony. Uh, and we're, we're not staying long in E flat major, we're going back pretty soon here. Back to the safe, nice G flat major. And this is a proper cadence with the dominant. Kind of a D flat with extra jazzy notes. The long chord just filled out with some scale notes uh, in the low ratio. We don't really get anywhere. This is again just G flat major. It's a dominant uh, D flat major, but with a G flat pedal. And tonic. But now, This is a new chord when we get the F flat, uh, but this bar, this is kind of a new texture that uh, is going to come in the end of the piece as well. It's kind of a nice humble uh, tripping around here. This F flat is really outside the G flat tonality, so it's really noticeable when it comes. So now when we get the C flat major, now this is a tonic because the previous bar is modulating to it as a tonic. But we only have it for like one bar and then the next bar. Now we have a descent going down and uh, have diminuendos with this nice chord. So already here we're leaving C flat major and it's kind of implying back to G flat major with this clear dominant. This is a D flat ninth chord. So this is like where we are, but we never get the G flat major and we move on instead. Two. It's the old E flat major. We've already had it. Uh, so this is a mediant again. And now. And per anime is a bit moving forward. Now we get a little bit of happy outburst here. Whoa! So now we get the C flat major, but when we're in E flat major, the C flat is the median, so it's flipped the other way around. Uh, this is a very nice moment. It's like the climax of the piece here. coming down again. So here at the top the harmonic pace is quickening. Uh, we get more chords that's going in a faster way, a lot of things going on. And I'm just gonna take it apart a little bit in detail, even if it goes by very fast. So we have the C flat major as median, and then it's going to E flat minor. So we've established the E flat major for these bars. And when it goes to the minor, it's kind of, it's switching from the major mode to minor. And then when we get this A flat major, th this is the subdominant to E flat major or minor. It doesn't really matter. It's a subdominant. So we get this plagal feeling. So if I now play, it's a subdominant major to E flat minor in this case. So again, and now the exact same thing, one octave down. But now instead of going back to, to E flat minor, we get the D flat dominant to G flat major. But it's not, it's kind of G flat major, but we have the E flat as a sixth. 
So it's kind of somewhere in the middle of G flat major and E flat minor. Uh, and you can't really decide 100% which one it is. Now we get some classic Debussy pentatonic chords just laying around here. And again, going up. So you can tell it's pentatonic because we're only playing on the black keys here. That's the easy pentatonic scale to catch. Uh, there was actually a pentatonic scale earlier that I forgot to mention. When we are at the E flat major place, this is also a pentatonic scale. Uh, okay, back to this place. And here we get the C flat, so it's not all black keys. clear cadential. So now we're expecting G-flat major. But here Debussy again diverts the expectations and puts in the C-flat major which is now a clear subdominant again. The plagal chord. And now this is approaching the end, the close of the piece. Now we get the initial melody stated again a solo in the high and super sweet register. Lovely moment here. And we also have this line below it, really nice. You should um, play it loud, I think, in a performance because it's so nice. But the melody is on top still. And now we get an echo of this texture again, the humbling tripping around. We get it without the F flat, so the first time it goes and we get the modulating to C flat. Now we're staying within the G flat tonality. And murmurer est en retenant peu à peu, is murmuring and slowing down gradually. And now a final line of chords in the pentatonic scale, uh, G flat major territory. And resolving to a G flat major. And the final uh, broken octaves. Just for the atmosphere. I must say I really like how Debussy is using these three chords, the G flat major, the C flat major and E flat major, and the music is floating around and modulating between them, and when the chord comes they have different roles depending on where the music are at the moment. It could be the tonic or the subdominant or the median, and the music is constantly developing between them. Thanks for watching Sonata Secrets. Subscribe if you're new to the channel and let me know what you think about Debussy's music in the comments. And a special thank you to my Patreon, B. Ngoyen, in this episode. Now I give you my rendition of Debussy's prelude, The Girl with the Flaxen Hair. <laughs>